Dr. Ethel Tunkohan, an assistant professor of politics at York University. This is Academic Antis. Since we last spoke, I've been quite stressed out. I thought that the end of term would give me much needed respite from the anxieties of work, but this has proven not to be the case. This is what happened. I, along with many of my assistant professor colleagues, have been waiting for months to learn whether or not we've been granted tenure. I knew the decision would take a while, but then I started to hear from happy colleagues who received their tenure letters while there was radio silence with my file. Imagine my shock when I found out that my tenure file, which passed unanimously at the department level, never got sent up to the dean's office. From the end of October until the beginning of May, my file did not go up the required levels. And though this oversight is starting to get resolved and my file is now with the dean, I couldn't help but wonder, what do these oversights tell us about how the institution values our work? The fact that this happened to me and to another colleague in my department, another Asian professor during Asian Heritage Month is so richly ironic. As Professor Roland Coloma notes in a 2013 article, Asians are both invisible and hypervisible. On the one hand, we are coded as hard workers who stay in the background. Yet on the other hand, there are circumstances when we are also perceived as threats. It reminds me of an article that was published in 2010 by McLean's magazine asking if certain universities in Canada have become, quote unquote, too Asian. I was a graduate student at that time and I was furious. What does it even mean to code universities as being too Asian? Is there a tipping point where we can't have too many of us? And then I talked to a white colleague about it who then said, why are you so upset? The article actually says good things about Asians, that you're hardworking and smart. This is the problem. How do you fight back when racism isn't so obvious? Can we even call these so-called compliments racist? How do we deal with the model minority stereotype? And how do we resist it? With me today are Dr. Jessica Sidergo and Dr. Haiyan Chu, who unpack these tensions. Okay, so um, I'm Jessica Sidergo, and I'm an assistant professor as of seven weeks ago um, at, the <laughs> at the University of Amsterdam, the Department of Political Science. And my work looks at uh, conflict, religious and ethnic in Indonesia. Hello, my name's Heian Chu. I, I'm a social professor of sociology at the University of Toronto. I've been teaching here for 10 years. Um, before this, I was a PhD student in Wisconsin, Madison in the U.S. for seven years. I'm originally from South Korea. This is awesome. Welcome, Auntie Jessica and Auntie Haiyan. Um, let's talk about grad school itself and academia as a whole. So Jess and I, people would think that I was her, right? Like, <laughs> so they would call me Jessica. And Jess, you would be called Ethel too, right? I remember, so um, Ethel had just graduated. And then I went to APSA, the American Political Science Association meeting. And I just met this professor in their office um, probably four weeks before. So I assumed that they remembered who I was, but they were like, didn't you graduate already? Like, why are you here in this like thing? And I was just like, oh, and then I realized that they totally thought I was Ethel. Which is and so odd, right? It's like, I... So I think they were like, they had gotten your the announcement that you had finished. And then they were like, why is like, Ethel here in this like graduate student how to write a proposal? <laughs> You didn't tell me that. Are you serious? Yeah. It's so odd as well because this is this happens to all of us, right? Like I remember I remember who was it I was talking to? This was back in grad school and you had just started, but then they were talking to me about like conflict zones in Indonesia and I was like, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> Cuz that's not my research, right? And then you just kind of walk away and leave and I got coffee at the second cup downstairs. Then I then it kind of the light bulb dinged and I was like, "Oh my god, they thought it was Jessica." And Hayan, we don't look alike, right? Jess and I, can you affirm to our listeners? Yes, you don't look alike and you know, it doesn't stop in grad school, right? We experienced it when we are Professor said, well, um, I've heard it from even more senior, um, colleagues who, who've 
experienced it, even among people who colleagues who've been together in the same department for more than 15, 20 years, this kind of mix up, um, unfortunately, continues to happen for many Asian faculty members, and I'm sure to other racialized faculty members as well. For sure. And has this happened to you? And or have there have you faced other weird microaggressions specific to Asian academics? Um, the mix-ups certainly have happened to me. I I think it would be rare to find somebody um, to whom this doesn't happen. If you're Asian uh, women or even Asian men, it does happen very, I would say at least a couple times a year. It's also very more common to, to me is also to be mistaken as a student or as a staff member. That does happen quite often, I think. And the idea that we somehow look young, um, I mean, you know, they mean it as a compliment, but... <laughs> yeah, I, let's touch on that. They mean it as a compliment, and we're socialized into thinking it's a compliment, but it's actually not when you unpack it, right? Because certainly, I've had colleagues in my current job who say, oh, but you look so young, you know? Um, or even graduate students who would say, Oh, yeah, you, how old are you? 25? And it's like, this is right before teaching a class. And you're thinking, well, first of all, I don't want to out how old I am. That's kind of weird, right? And secondly, what does that imply? Well, I think it's the assumptions that we are inexperienced. We are kind of don't have the same level of um, competency or, you know, things like that. Um, and it's kind of like complimenting your English or lack of accents or, you know, those kinds of compliments, um, quote and unquote. Um, and I, and I would, oh, sorry, I was going to say, and I would say that, um, it's, it's, I don't know about the young thing, but definitely m being mistaken for a student, it's like, it's, um, you know, for a long time, I, I kind of was, I guess I shouldn't be mad about it because it's a compliment, but in some, in a, in a lot of ways, it's because people can't imagine you in that position. And the funny thing is, I find that I try to combat that by dressing up. But I remember one of the comments I got from a colleague was when I was wearing like this Banana Republic, like, I don't know, like dress suit. <laughs> I was thinking I look professional and yet this colleague was like, how old are you? <laughs> and I'm just like, dude, I'm wearing like, I was trying to get the attire of what I think a professor should look like in order for me not to have to face these questions. And yet I still get asked this. When I first um, teach a class, um, in the first class, I usually mention I've been teaching here for 10 years. And you oh. sometimes do students like visible surprise. <laughs> Really? Right. That's, uh, yeah, because it's easy for some people to see you as a junior faculty, but it's also harder. I mean, going with what Jessica said, you know, it's harder for people to imagine that you're mid career or senior. I'm also starting to think of other like microaggressions that we just kind of take for granted as well. And quite frankly, like, I think this current political moment, and we'll go back to that in a second, has elucidated to me um, how invisible anti-Asian microaggressions or aggression aggressions are. And we've just kind of accepted it as normal. Um, so another example that kind of came to mind um, was uh, how how food can be markers of otherness as well. I remember um, in my previous graduate school department, we would have these potlucks, right? And um, when I was starting, I didn't realize that there was a cultural script for some, not all, but for some of these potlucks, depending on the host, um, where the food that you bring is supposed to embody like bon appetit chic, right? Like it's not supposed to be, you know, quote unquote, like ugly food. It's supposed to be, I don't know, like charcuterie, cheese, grapes, hummus, tzatziki. Okay, I'm just listing out all, <laughs> a bunch of different foods. Maybe I'm hungry because it's almost lunch. But but I brought, um, um, do you know those walnut cakes that you buy in Koreatown? Those little, those little balls. And so I like bring this plate and I'm like, do, 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 here is my plate. And, you know, go to the potluck. Um, our host, uh, a faculty member graciously 
takes the plate. Um, and then we're kind of sitting there, you know, drinking wine and talking. And I notice that my dish remained in the kitchen. And at first I was like, oh, she, there's, the table was full, right? Like she probably was going to bring it out later. Um, but then another grad student came and brought like a Caesar salad or something. And immediately it got placed at the table. And so, you know, didn't think about this for like 15 years. And then I remembered this uh, this year after people were posting about anti-Asian uh, microaggressions. And I was like, that's messed up, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, food is being seen as markers of otherness. I mean, that's so interesting, Ethel. The one area, and I totally hear you with, with when it comes to food, but I one thing that I get nervous about is always like wine. You know, maybe that's um, a class thing, but it's also, I think, a um, cultural backgrounds like, you know, in Indonesia is not a big wine drinking uh, country. And so I don't really know anything about wine, like even now, you know, and I, I think, um, in a lot of like in the job market or even in during grad school where you, you know, you have wine with faculty, um, you know, a lot of people grew up with that, but you know, I certainly didn't. There was something that gave me a lot of anxiety. And I would also say that I think even growing up, there's a uh, policing or, you know, I think there's something seen as, uh, like gross sometimes about Asian food. Right. And I think that's changing in, in many contexts, but I, it's weird how a lot of these like traumas from childhood kind of, um, like you carry them with you. So I even remember like every time I would go in the beginning when I would like bring my lunch to, to eat in, you know, where the grad students would eat together, I would try to always have like non odorous or like palatable food, you know, to bring it. And, and it was weird because I didn't even think about why it was, it was almost like second nature to me to do that. Yeah. I mean, who, at least people, for people who grew up here, who didn't get bullied for bringing like, you know, noodles because kids would be like, oh, they're like worms. And you're like, they're not like worms. I don't know what worms taste like, but they don't look, they, they do not, they're not like worms, right? And, well, pasta and then pasta looks like worms. Yeah, pasta then. looks like worms. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And then it's evolved, right? Where we still bring our kind of culinary hang ups because of these like racist behavior that we um, experienced when we were growing up. And then like our colleagues are like, oh my gosh, look at my chicken adobo and you taste it and you're like mm, mm, you know it's not you know and they're so proud of it so it's kind of it's like it's like our bullies have become cultural voyeurs right so it's like shifted and twisted and sometimes you're not even seen as like the legitimate authority on your own food so remember i know like you know at a party um this one person so there's this indonesian salad called gado gado it's a uh, so it has eggs in it, it's lettuce, and it has a peanut sauce in it. And this person um, had this cookbook that had, <laughs> like, Asian cuisines. And he was like, um, he asked me, like, I make this gado gado soup and um, all the time. It's really good. And I was like, oh, well, you know, it's not. And he's like, is it authentic? And I was like, well, you know, in Indonesia. And by the way, like, gado gado is from the region where my mom grew up. Um, and he, and I was like, well, you know, I mean, the ingredients look right, but usually in Indonesia, it's a salad and not a soup. And then I found out that guy literally went, um, like after I can, I told him that it wasn't authentic. He went to the white guy, um, who's a, a white student who, you know, we're friends, but he, he also did research on Indonesia and he had at the, the guy asked him to be like the same question. And he said the exact same thing, obviously, because there's no such, like, Indonesians don't have gado gado soup. And I remember being so mad about that because I was like, what makes this, like, this is my food, you know, this is the food I grew up with. Why did you need to confirm with someone else that you thought was more of an expert than me on the food that I eat? Like, So this is what I mean, right? Like, these are the encounters that, you know, on the one hand, it's it's fine. Like, it's not like, you know... It's not like it it harms you outright, right? But I feel like this is death through a thousand paper cuts because it's an accumulated lifetime of these encounters that I find really distressing to have to to have to grapple with, right? 
Do you know what I mean? It's like, ugh, like it, then you would be petty, Jess, if you confronted the guy and was like, do you know what I mean? At the party. And if you were like, how dare you? How dare you talk? Do you know what I mean? Then it becomes, you become the weird one, right? Like, but how do you then respond to it? I think it's it's not just, in many ways, it's a micro, but it's a microaggression, obviously, about a, a, a dish that's a salad or a soup. But in many ways, it, I think what made me upset about it was the question of authority and who who has the authority to speak on, you know, on not like on, on issues related to a place that I also study, you know, and who is given, whose opinions are given more credit. Have you ever been in spaces where people tell you um, or try to inform you about <laughs> what's it, what's it really like in Indonesia? I definitely remember one moment in grad school where I, I'm trying to figure out how to not name names, but, um, it was a, it was, it was a fellow grad student. Um, and this person wanted to write about, um, an incident of violence, uh, that my f- father had basically gone through, not like he wasn't a, a victim in, in the same way, but I remember sharing it. And then the person basically saying that my interpretation was not accurate and, you know, and now that I have had distance with it, um, I understand that this person was coming at it from a scholarly, wanting to have a scholarly debate about this particular incident, but it came, I, I went, but it was so like close to my personal experience that it's, you know, I'm trying to share and engage. And then the person was basically like your interpretation of of the history is wrong. And I remember just even saying like, I've been studying Indonesia for five years because that person being like, I, I was reading about this for, for the summer, you know, like three months, this person had read about this case. And, um, you know, at, at that point I just felt really upset because I was like, well, I'm Indonesian, but also I've been like studying this for five years. So, or four years at that point. For sure. And I feel like that's when it gets a little bit tricky as well, right? Because we have to establish that uh, our expertise, you know, and our lived experience is not equivalent to this person reading something, right? Like an article that they read does not equate to your expertise and your lived experience. And again, these are encounters that are so commonplace and it's so hard to know how to react in the moment itself. Just to jump on at this point, I just had a story where um, a chair of a panel at the International Studies Association meeting once told me, um, he basically, he literally, it was, it's almost a, a direct quote. He said, I don't believe your justification for your case selection because I know that you just wanted to go home. <gasps> what did you say? I said something that was, I, I, just that my response was to, you know, um, diffuse tension. And so I, I just like laughed it off, but I should not have done that. Um, you know, in the moment you're, you don't know what to say to that. And so I just, you know, made a joke or whatever. Let's, let's start talking about, you know, kind of the hardest topic that I think has kind of caused us a lot of anxiety the last few weeks. Um, the events of Atlanta um, happened, I think, about two months ago, right? And it was in the U.S., but I think it kind of brought up a lot of our increased experiences of anti-Asian racism in the time of COVID. And also, I mean, it precedes that, but I think it's intensified during the time of COVID. Um, and I guess one of the things I wanted to ask was... Why was it so hard? Why do you think it was so hard to get people in our respective institutions or even in our daily lives to recognize that this was actually um, an anti-Asian attack? You know, after the Atlanta shootings, um, for me, that kind of was um, the occasion that I felt finally people are seeing this mm. the rise of anti-asian racism and violence and that made me uh, very sad i really felt like at that time the kinds of anti-asian attack and violence have been rising for more than a year and it was happening in toronto in montreal new york san francisco and everywhere 
so that it re- it really didn't need a, a mass shooting for people to mm. see that. But but at the same time, I do think that was a turning point for many people, my mm. colleagues, my university, my department, um, to see what uh, anti-Asian racism looked like. So, Haiyan, like you have been so active in terms of illuminating the realities of anti-Asian racism and specifically gendered uh, racism facing um, Asian women in particular. Um, what was your impetus in organizing um, these panels with uh, representatives from um, different um, Asian activist groups? Like, what was the goal? And how did you keep kind of going um, when it comes to organizing in the midst of also feeling intense pain? Yeah, at that time when the shooting just happened, you know, we just felt like, um, we, especially my close colleagues in Korean studies community and other um, Asian communities, we felt like we really have to do something so that we create a space where people are not isolated. People can come together to talk about, um, how this is affecting us. But also, you know, we still are kind of, hung up on, is this race issue? Is this race gender issue? Is this like sex work issue? Like what, what kind of issue is this? That kind of binary um, framework. So I do think it is important that we bring in different community um, organizations and people who are working, who've been working on these issues for, for many years um, to see that this is not new. And this really is a complicated issue that have different uh, multiple dimensions. The fact that you are debating even internally about, well, is this race? Is this sex? Is this is this about occupational discrimination, like like class discrimination, right? Because some of the people, some of the women um, who were killed tragically were um, sex workers as well. So how do we kind of navigate these complexities, but also recognizing that within Asian diaspora communities, we're not a monolith, right? Like we have diverse groups from diverse um, cultural backgrounds, but also diverse class positionalities, right? Yeah, I actually think, you know, um, hypothetically, if this kind of mass shooting of um, Asian massage workers, if it happened three years ago, before this um, kind of more visible Asian, uh, anti-Asian violence that pe- many people are experiencing on the strip after the COVID. If it happened before that, I actually don't know whether Asian communities would have come together in the same way to support these, mourn these women. And I think there's a lot of work that we as an Asian community members should do to address that. And I think what's interesting is that you're right. Like, I mean, reflecting on the last year as well, um, and COVID and how it was kind of initially seen as the Chinese flu, Wuhan flu. Um, and then it kind of evolved and mutated into uh, being seen as something that Asians have, right? I'm still finding it hard to kind of grapple with that. And maybe some of us haven't had direct encounters with racists during COVID. But I think some of us, myself included, have embodied like internal bordering practices where I don't go to grocery stores um, that are Western because I don't feel safe and I don't want people to like stare at me weirdly, right? I mean, I lived in in Dupont Circle in Wash in, when I was in DC, but I essentially old, like didn't go early in the morning because I wanted to make sure that there would be people there. Though you know, I guess having a lot of people doesn't you know necessarily keep you safe. But I felt like there was a higher probability that someone could come to your defense if you know, there are more people there. So I remember, you know, telling like, um, like my, a, a friend of mine, um, who, you know, who was in DC at the time. And he's, he's, a like, he's a Filipino heritage. And he was like hassled quite a number, like two or three times. And I was like, don't go running in the morning, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. Um, not interesting. It's terrible. The way, the, the ways that like what I now think about, you know, yeah, I've been um pretty careful about 
maybe too careful about、um, not like walking by myself,、um, things like that, in a way that really makes me kind of mad because that way of、um, being in the city I've never experienced before, and that that's because、um, I've I've been attacked on a bus.、Uh, In earlier in the pandemic,、um, you know, like the whole Chinese thing, and and that、uh, kind of made me change my relationship to the kind of public spaces. I'm so sorry to hear that.、Um, I didn't, I didn't know that. Like, did someone just call you a name, or well, not just, but what what happened? Yeah, somebody was、uh, trying to kind of get. At me by saying like,、uh, why do these Chinese people have to bring COVID to our country, you know, and all that? And I mean,、uh, actually, some people had to like actively step in、oh、because the person was coming at me. So, and that was like very early in a pandemic, like February of last year. I'm so sorry. That's not okay. And. You know, I don't want to minimize it. That's violence. This seems to be a recurring theme in this hangout, right? Like, how do we react in the moment when confronted with violence? In your case, in this story, and when when we encounter like comments that are at face value benign but are actually harmful. Well, I think in a cases like this, the best you can do is to protect yourself. If it's、mm-hmm. like extremely risky, then I think it's much better to leave. And in some situations of microaggression, even in the university setting, I think in many cases it's better to leave、um, and leave at that. But in other cases where interventions are necessary and maybe helpful, one trick that I have、um, when I hear kind of you know comments that are p- problematic,、um, you can ask, "What do you mean by that?" Mm. And you shift、um, the focus and make the other person explain whatever the person said. I mean, I would say that you know, in, in I remember in a previous episode you were saying how、uh, academics are conflict averse. I feel like I am both Canadian and my parents grew up in Java, and so I'm like double conflict averse. And so you know, I I think what I've been trying to do. Recognizing that this is something that I struggle with, is to be more intentional about you know speaking up when I can.、Um, I think that you know this is kind of behavior, like keeping your head down, is behavior that I'm trying to unlearn and、um, and so you know I'm like you, Ethel. I beat myself up a lot if I you know and when when I don't say something in the moment because I don't know what to say or I freeze up. But I think it seems to me is that. That I've seen in myself is that the more you do speak、mm-hmm. up, I think the better you get at it. And so it's about sort of、um, pushing yourself to say something, even though you know it feels risky. Or I'm trying to to practice. Practice makes perfect, right? Absolutely, I love that. It's kind of like you know we have to be strategic, but the more that you speak up, the easier it becomes.、Um, Final question,、um, and then we're gonna wrap up because this has been such a rich conversation, and I'm going to think a lot about your words of wisdom. One thing I wanted to pivot to because this is something that a lot of folks have emailed us about is how do you reorient yourself and learn who you are outside the academy? You know, one thing,、um, and this goes back to a bit of、um, the Atlanta shootings. I've been thinking about for the past couple months. I am Asian Canadian, you know. I've been here for ten years, and but for some reason, I haven't been involved in the Asian Canadian communities in a way that I would like. And this past few months and past year have really taught me, you know, what like it asked me like what why why is that? Of course, we're busy with work and all that, but. Um, I do think we. It's good that we think about、um, which communities we belong、um, other than our jobs. I thought I'm kind of at the university. That's my community,、um, but I think、um, I'm trying to do more、um, to be more involved in the community、uh, recent, recently. Well, you know, I think 
in many ways, I, this pandemic has um, sort of reinforced the need to, you know, be someone outside of your job. But I think, you know, what I've I've been realizing over the past year is like, you know, how will people remember you by, or like, how will you matter to people um, when you're gone? And it's not like sometimes it's your work, sure, but I think often it's the relationships that you build. Thank you so much. Auntie Jessica, Auntie Hayan, um, uh, you have imparted such wisdom and such clarity and such loving advice that I am so honored that we were able to share this space. This conversation made me think of a few things. We need to nuance our understanding of resistance. Doing something doesn't mean doing something instantaneously. We can and should give ourselves time and space to reflect. We have different ways of resisting microaggressions and actual aggressive behavior, and we should do what feels right for us and what keeps us safe. Also, it is crucial to carve out generative spaces of support. In that vein, there are a bunch of events coming up on May 28 and 29 for Asian Heritage Month organized by Scholar Strike Canada, which I link to in the show notes. And finally, because this gave me so much joy and hope, listen to the song Racist Sexist Boy by the Linda Lindas. If you're on social media, you may have seen this already. If not, Google it. It's my rallying cry for the summer. That's Academic Aunties for this month. If you like this podcast, help spread the word. The best way to do that is to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps. If you want to get in touch with us and read all the show notes for this and other episodes, visit academicantes.com. We are also on Twitter, so follow us. We'd love to hear from you. Today's episode of Academic Antis was hosted by me, Dr. Ethel Tungohan, and produced by myself and Wayne Chu. Listen to us next time as we talk to more Academic Antis. Until then, take care, be kind to yourself, and don't be an asshole.